أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله والله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد All praise be unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our cherisher our sustainer we bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we give shukr and thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for once again allowing us to congregate here in the house of Allah, this waqt of Jum'ah. We send our love, our greetings, our salutations to beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to his pious and pure family, and to all those who follow his sunnah until the end of time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be steadfast on the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this dunya. And may Allah grant us to be in his company on the day of Qiyamah in Jannah. Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the hajj of our hujaj, their rituals, their ibadat. May Allah grant them a hajj magbul, a hajj mabrur. May Allah grant them to complete the last day of hajj without any incident. May all our hujaj from all over the world return safely. Ameen. Alhamdulillah, it is with great pride and sense of happiness that we witness this hajj period. It is a renewal for us as an ummah. Each year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this opportunity to witness the hajj. And to see the ibadat of our hujaj being performed. And alhamdulillah, with modern technology, it's as if though we are there and we can be part of this hajj. Now, it's only a very small portion of the ummah, a very small fraction of the ummah that actually performs this hajj ibadat. That's only about two, three, four million, whatever it might be, of the 1.5 billion of the ummah. Yet all of us, we, our hearts are attached on the hajj with them. We are connected with them. And it's as if though we are part of it. And in fact, they do the ibadah, yet we all share in the goodness of this ritual. We all have an Eid, we all participate in the sacrifice on the day of the day of Nahar, and we benefit from this great blessing of Hajj. And the lessons we know, once you go on Hajj, you know, even in our past, I was speaking to my grandfather, you know, Hafidullah, preserve me for many, many years. He said, when you came back from Hajj, you know, you, tra- you were transformed. You were not just Buddha Muhammad anymore, you Haji Muhammad. And that Haji title stayed with you, even if you're on the rugby field, wherever it was. Because performing Hajj was a big deal. It is a big deal. And you are transformed as a person. I can see I had a good friend of mine that is also, alhamdulillah, he's on Hajj right now. We were in a WhatsApp group, so he exited the group when Hajj began. Today he added back, he's in the group again. But I can see already he's a Haji. You know, he was Mani before, now he's Haji Mani. It's a different person now altogether. He's come in. Once, once you perform the Hajj, your perspective of life changes. The person you are changes, the way you see the world. And it should change that from the beginning or from when you end your Hajj to the rest of your life, you are a new person. Spiritually, physically, mentally, the way you see things, you've changed. Now, this is not just for the Hujaj. This transformation should be for us as well. Yes, of course, if you go, you are in that mode. But we can learn from Hajj. And let's take some of the lessons that is, that once we look at Hajj, and then we look at our life here in Cape Town and the rest of the world, we should put our, our issues on this, what we face every day, into perspective. So the first lesson we learn, if you were there on Hajj, may Allah grant all of us to return to the Holy Land, and those who will come back, they will tell you, we realize ultimately at the end of the day, when everything is said and done, life comes down to submission to Allah. That's ultimately why we are here. As Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That the purpose of life is going to be how much we submit and obey and fulfill our obligations to Allah. Allah says, I have not created man and jinn, except that we should submit ourselves to him. We should surrender ourselves to him. The Haji, when he comes, he's completely in submission to Allah. Now nothing matters. It is only Allahu Akbar. Only Allah is the one that counts. When you look at the tawaf, for example, this going around, what is this thing? If you, you know, our five-year-olds ask us, why do they go around the Kaaba? What is the symbolism of that? If we see from the smallest thing, the atom, there's a nucleus and things go around it to the biggest things in the universe, planets going around a star, a star going around a, a galaxy. There is a focal point, a central you know, force that keeps you grounded. For us as Muslims, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That everything goes back to Allah. That ibadah, submission to Allah, not just the ritual, not just about coming to the masjid or performing hajj and umrah. Ibadah, we know as Muslims, is a life. 
It's a lifelong uh, um, ambition that you do. Ibadah, submission to Allah, is in everything that we do. The way we walk, the way we talk, the way we use the bathroom, the way we do our business, the way we interact with one another, it is through submission of Allah. And that is ultimately what counts. As we said, this hajj did not begin with this ummah. Ummah of Muhammad It didn't even begin with Nabi Ibrahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Nabi Ibrahim, says to us, the very first house, the very first place of worship was in Mecca. Long before, it could even be before Nabi Adam was created. This place, Bakka, was the place of ibadah. And when we come and we commemorate and we see annually millions of people coming there, there are those who submit to Allah. And we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counts us that we are those who submit. And that submission should continue throughout our life in all our affairs. When we look at Hajj, one of the lessons you take out of it, for those who've done the Ihram, anyone who's been on Umrah, for those who have gone on Hajj, you've done the Ihram, the closest clothing for the men in particular, the thing that you're wearing is actually your kafan. That's what you will be buried in ultimately. When you stand on Hajj or on Arafah and you, all you have is that Ihram on you and Allah has taken away your titles, Allah has taken away your nationality, Allah has taken away your social status, your, your money, everything, even your body is haram. Even Allah tells you, this body doesn't belong to you. You can't remove one hair from it. Nothing belongs to you. It all belongs to me. And this is how we will enter the qabr. No matter what we achieve in life, no matter how much riches and you know, pomp and prestige we get in life, but ultimately we will be reduced to weighing that kafan and being buried in the qabr. And that's where it's going to go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, this is what life is all about. Everything is immaterial. You started off in the dunya naked with nothing. You in this dunya naked, belong, nothing owns, you own nothing. It's on loan, it's on lease. There's no reason to feel pride or sense of grandeur. That's why we say, Allah, you are akbar, not me. You are the best, you are the greatest, you are superior. Nothing else matters. And we hope that this should not be. You know, the problem with, one of the problems with the ummah, we do the ritual very perfectly. We do the rituals beautifully, but the essence does not permeate into our life. One who wears that ihram and you realize once you take it off, it didn't change. I'm, not out, I'm out of the state of ihram, but the reality is this body, my wealth, my treasures, my state, status is only on loan. It's going to be taken away from me maybe tomorrow, maybe a week, maybe a few years. So we should not depend on that. We should not be using that to fulfill, you know, to feel any greatness in ourselves. Also on, attached to the ihram. The Prophet ﷺ says, as you regard this day, in the day of Arafah, in this place, the, the Mecca, in this month as haram, understand that the wealth and the property, the honor of every person is haram, meaning it's sacred. No one would come to Hajj, impossible. You would stand in, in haram, in ihram, and you punch somebody or sway someone. You'll never do that. The Prophet is saying that sanctity exists even outside of Hajj. That level of, of, of haram exists even outside of hajj. Not only in hajj that you must behave yourself, but you should continue after hajj. So when you come back from hajj, if you are hajji, it's expected now that you've realized this, I can't speak ill of each other. I can't harm anyone with my tongue, with my hand, in the way I do my business. I can't harm my wife, my kids. And this, of course, applies to us as well. We have either performed hajj or will be performing hajj. This continues. We also learn from hajj the sense of the repayment for sacrifice. Nabi Ibrahim salam, was commanded by Allah, build the Kaaba. Give yourself, give something for the sake of the deen. You build it. And Allah will repay that dividend many times over. How many millions of people have been performing Hajj since the Kaaba was built by Nabi Ibrahim? How many people have performed Salah in this masjid for those who have built this masjid? In Bukab, alhamdulillah, we have masajid which are 150 years old. One person might have just donated a brick. He long time passed away, but his ibadah, his sacrifice continues to be rewarded over and over. Allah teaches us that when you sacrifice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will return and repay what you have sacrificed with dividends many, many times over. When you give of you the things you love for the sake of Allah, Allah will repay it in something even better. Now Allah tested Nabi Ibrahim. Allah didn't ask him, give me only your time, your money. Allah said, what do you love the most? You love this little boy, Ismail, the most. Allah says, sacrifice that boy. Choose me over him as a test. This, this is how the Anbiya are tested. Allah takes the dearest things to their hearts, and Allah says, will you give that up for my sake? 
Allah doesn't test us like that. But Allah is asking, sacrifice a little of yourself. When the towel goes by, yes, it is good to put five rand, it is good to make a dua, but the best of the best are those who sacrifice themselves. They put themselves in the towel. They look at their environment, their society, what can I give back to the ummah? Because as you realize with ihram, the things that we really focus on is going to be taken away from us. Our wealth, our family, our health is going to be taken away. al baqiyatu salihat But the things that will remain eternally are the good deeds you left behind. Are the good investments we leave behind. Leave something for yourself that will endure after you've passed away. Sacrifice that which we love for the sake of Allah. And what I mean by that is join the masjid committee. Join the neighborhood watch. Join the parent teachers association. We should, be, we should understand that it goes beyond ourselves. We need to do something for the sake of the greater good. And this is what really will bring value to our lives in this dunya and the akhirah. Also, alhamdulillah, we see in Hajj, when Allah says to Nabi Ibrahim, those many millennia ago, six, seven thousand years ago, in a place that had no population, there was no one living in Mecca. The first people to inhabit Mecca was Nabi Ismail and Hajar, alayhi salam. Allah says, leave them there. He put his trust in Allah. He left them there. Not even a drop of water was there. It's before Zamzam was discovered. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, build the Kaaba. وَأَذِّن فِي النَّاسِ الْحَجِّ And proclaim to mankind, call them to come for hajj. Call them that they need to perform hajj. Now this is in the middle of nowhere. This is like in the middle of the Karoo, in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Allah says, you build this masjid and you tell people they must come here. Ya Allah, who's here? There's no one living here. Allah says, don't worry. You do the ibadah. You trust me. They will come to you walking and riding and on every mode of transportation. They will come in kulli fajjin amik. They will come from every distant part of the world. They will come. You do it. You leave the results to me. So when we see this prophecy coming through, Allah made the promise to Nabi Ibrahim. And alhamdulillah, Nabi Ibrahim made this dua, Ya Allah, let my rituals be continuously being be emulated we are the answer of that dua imagine that every haji that performs hajj nabi ibrahim made dua ya allah let people come to this place you are the answer of nabi ibrahim's dua and we see this goodness so what we take from this ayah is allah made a promise until the end of time no matter how weak how poor how much difficulty this ummah goes in there will always be people that will come and perform hajj that there are certain strengths in this ummah Allah has put as a default. It will never be taken away from this ummah. We are not in a great position as an ummah currently. We are divided. We are fighting with one another. We have lost so much of the honor and the izzah that we once had. But no matter how bad things are, millions of people will come to perform hajj. From every land, from every nation, from every country, there will be one or two or millions of people that will come to venerate and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is this built-in greatness, strength in this ummah that will never disappear until the end of time. And we ask Allah that this ummah, this strength should increase. That we live in a time where the izza of the deen is made high once again. So we never should feel despondent. We can feel sad. We can feel bad at the state of affairs, but we don't give up hope. This ummah is always a positive ummah. That in as weak as we are, there are so much there's so much greatness in it. I reflect that you know, as imams, we encourage you know we speak about many things about charity, about you know being good husbands, good wives, and we need to remind ourselves and our congregation over and over. And it stays, and sometimes it it, it you know come doesn't stay. But something like Hajj, very seldomly do we hear the imams encouraging people sign up for Hajj, sign up for Hajj. Yet people do this. Without us, you know, forcing or even motivating the next generation. And you know, we always complain about our younger generation. A new generation of youngsters will come and they will take it upon themselves. I want to perform Hajj. As this Hajj season ends, another a group of people may be sitting here and think, I want to put my name on the list. Where did that come from? It is that inbuilt love that Allah has placed for this Ummah, for Makkah, Medina, Masjid Al-Aqsa, that these places will always be dear to us as an Ummah. One of the powerful messages of Hajj, and something which we, would, we should always reflect on, on the day of Arafah, and the symbolism of day of Arafah, think about this for a second. Makkah, of course, the Kaaba is the most sacred place on, on the earth. Yet for the most important day of Hajj, the day of Arafah, Allah does not tell the Hajjis, complete your Hajj in the Haram. Allah takes them out of the Haram area to a place called Arafah, which has nothing there really. If you look at Arafah today, there's nothing. If you looked at Arafah a week ago, there's nothing. It's just barren, open land with a few hills. Allah makes you stand there from Dhuwar until Maghrib. 
Why? The symbolism is of the day of Qiyamah, where everyone will gather, and Allah Himself, in a manner which befits His majesty, descends on the people of Arafah to remind ourselves that day will come when we will all stand like that on a plane and we'll all have to answer to Allah. May Allah grant us a good return to Him on that day. But the symbolism of the day of Arafah here and what we hope for in the dunya is that those six hours or those four hours, if done sincerely, can forgive a lifetime of sin. Four hours and your entire life of sin, all of it, is forgiven. Our ummah, we have this inbuilt understanding. Allah forgives. And forgiveness is not only for Arafah or for the Hajjis. It's not only for Makkah and those who make Umrah. Forgiveness is here in Cape Town. Today, every day. Allah forgives daily. Allah forgives all the time. All we need to do is raise our hands and ask, Ya Allah, forgive. Allah is the one who loves to forgive. That we learn in this ritual of Hajj, no matter how bad we are, Allah's forgiveness is always going to be bigger than that. In a hadith which I love, perhaps my most favorite hadith, Qudsi, where Allah Himself says, O son of Adam, you sin against me, night and day you sin against me, continuously. But if you raise your hands and ask for my forgiveness, I will continuously forgive you and I won't mind. I don't get tired or fed up or frustrated. I will continue to forgive. Oh, son of Adam, if you were to come to me with sins that came close to the, reaching the sky, meaning someone who sinned 50, 60 years, never made istighfar, now he comes back when he's gray, or the doctor gave him that bad di diagnosis, may Allah grant shifa to all those who are sick. Now you come to Allah. Allah says, I will forgive you, and I won't mind. Even Allah says, and this is a step even further, and you don't, this is a dangerous one. Allah says, even the one who comes on the day of Qiyamah, and he comes to Allah with a world full of sin. His whole life was sinful, and he did no good deeds. The only thing he avoided was committing shirk. He did not associate anyone in partnership with Allah. And then, on the da that day, Allah will still forgive and bring him a world filled with forgiveness. This is who Allah is. That no matter how bad your life is, no matter how bad the scorecard is, don't feel despondent. You, can, you and I, we can raise our hands, and today Allah can forgive that sins. This waqt of Jumu'ah is a blessed waqt. Allah can forgive all our sins at this very moment. We make sincere dua, Ya Allah, grant all the hujaj, all of them, a complete forgiveness of their sins. Let they have left Arafah with zero sins on the account. And may Allah accept from all of us our ibadat, our fasting, those who are able to fast and the duas. May Allah forgive our sins as well. Let we only meet Allah in a pure, perfect state. One of course, one of the major highlights of Hajj, one of the major highlights of Hajj is, especially in the time that we're living in, the time of disunity, is the oneness of the ummah. You know the acts of ibadah, we know we always are told we should keep our ibadah private. You know, we don't, when we make a donation, better to keep it secret. We make tahajjud, better to be in private. Yet the most important acts of ibadah, the five pillars of Islam, or the four pillars of Islam, salah, hajj, fasting, zakah, these are done communally. Better to make salah in jama'ah. The best waqt is the waqt of jumu'ah. When we fast, we fast together in Ramadan. When we perform hajj, we do it together as a community. Allah could have said, you make your private hajj whenever you're able to do so, you alone. No, Allah has made it that every Muslim must come on the same day and the same place and they should perform their rituals together. The same rituals. Why? Part of the ibadah, yes, is for Allah, that personal, that personal connection. But the other part of it is we are a community of one. We are one community. We are one, one ummah. The same hajj that the people of America perform is the same hajj that the people of China perform, the same hajj that we perform, the same hajj that Rasulullah performed. Across the world, we don't have a, a clergy. We don't have, you know, a, a, a group of ulama across the world that teaches the same hajj class. Yet everyone comes to Arafah and they understand the rituals and they perform it together. This shows us that we are part of one ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, when, he, when, Allah built, when Allah instructed Nabi Ibrahim to build the Kaaba, that the Kaaba will always be a focal point for the Ummah. And it will always be a place of sanctuary for the Ummah. It be, doesn't belong to any monarchy or any country. The harams belong to the Ummah. And the Kaaba is always a place, our reference point. So no matter how divided we are, no matter how different we are in our colors, in our cultures, in our social status, in our madhabs, in our views, we should remind, Allah is reminding us, the things that are important, we are united on that. We are united that we believe in one Allah. 
We are united that we love one Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have one Quran. We have one Qibla. We are united on the big things. We are one family. Those things that divide us are immaterial, insignificant things. Yes, we can discuss those things, and sometimes those discussions can become heated. You can have a eat on a different day, no problem. But remember, we have one deen ultimately. We can have more than one opinion, but we have only one ummah. We don't divide the ummah on the big things. So let's not divide on the small things. This is one of the big symbols of hajj. That we as a ummah will come together on one day. We'll put aside our differences and we're all in the same boat. And that shouldn't just be for Arafah. That shouldn't only be for Makkah. It should be here in Cape Town as well. That as much as you disagree with someone because he keeps maulad or doesn't keep maulad or because he keeps eat on one day doesn't, doesn't uh, a different day or he's a Hanafi or Shafi no, no matter how much you disagree on those things understand this man like you he woke up and he performed Fajr Salah like you he gave his zakah like you he fasted like you he's going to raise his hands and besiege Allah and recite the Quran now if you're going to focus on the small things that divide then be fair and look at the big things that unite us and Allah keeps reminding us, we see this on TV, we see how we can come together in a distant land. We should bring that unity here in the ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that this ummah be kept together. And in fact, in the farewell sermon, this was the one thing that the Prophet, the beginning of his sermon was about this. Do not, and he said to the ummah, do not go back to the ways of jahiliyyah, fighting and harming one another as you did before Islam. Islam brought you together. And you are a brotherhood on Islam. Maintain on that on Islam. The last two points. You find in Hajj, and in particular in the context of Qurban, the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah has instructed us with Ihsan. Not who is Ihsan. Ihsan, not Buddha Ihsan. With Ihsan meaning perfection. That when you fight Jihad, when you fight Abu Jahl, when you fight the enemies, do so with perfection, meaning with care, with concern, with mercy. When you fight jihad, and when you slaughter the animal, slaughter that animal with ihsan, with care, with love, with, with mercy. Don't let them suffer. That's just something to think about. If you are required to have ihsan when you're fighting jihad with your enemy and slaughtering the animal, then how must you treat your Muslim brother? How must you treat each other, your wife, your kids? If the, your enemy gets ihsan, then obviously those who are close to you deserve more than ihsan. They deserve even a higher level of ihsan. And this perfection, what the Prophet is saying, in the smallest of things, or the things where you would think there should be no mercy, when I fight jihad, I should have no mercy. No, there you must have mercy. Then you should have mercy in your business transactions. You must have mercy in the way you talk to people. You must have mercy in your marriage. Ihsan goes into everything. It was on this day of Arafah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al lakum dinakum, That today I perfected the religion. I've perfected your way of life. I've perfected your iman. That we are an ummah that should strive for perfection in everything that we do. When you are at school, part of your deen is to be the best student. When you're a teacher, part of the deen, part of being a good Muslim is to be the best, best teacher, the best boss, the best imam, the best chairman, the best musalli, the best husband, the best wife. We don't aspire for anything but the best. This is what our ummah is about this is the way of life of our deen the last point that we should take in life from hajj you know uh, sister my sister-in-law i'm like except from her she went on hajj with her family and uh you know when you have a, an imam in the family then you easy you know every time there's a function they phone you it's dua or something you know free entertainment alhamdulillah so i was asked come um we're gonna do the unpakare for hajj now, I grew up in Saudi Arabia. Many of these customs, I'm not familiar with. So I said, ask my wife, what is unpakare? She said, no, what we do is we, you know, the whole family gets together and we pack the suitcases together. It's a customary thing. And we do this and we make dua. And, and subhanAllah, point, just a side note here. Now, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, alhamdulillah. And what I must say is, hajj is far more a big deal here than on that side. Why? Because it's easy. You can just say, look, next year I'm going for Hajj, alhamdulillah, you prepare a few weeks before the time. But here people prepare 20, 30 years before the time to go on Hajj. Their Hajj began actually 20 years ago. That Nia began, they saved what little they could. They went for Hajj class in year, in year out. They know the Hajj better than the Imam even. Right? That Hajj began so long ago. And it's a beautiful thing. We should keep that. It's a big deal, as my grandfather said. When you went on Hajj, it was a big deal in the community and it should stay that way. It's a lifelong objective goal. Even Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only performed one hajj. When he performed it, 
few months later, he passed away, meaning this is the culmination. Now there's perfection, it's done. So when I did this unpakare, I said, you know what? It's not part of the sunnah, of course, but it's a beautiful custom. And Allah mentions in the Quran, tazawwadu, that take with you your provisions when you go on hajj. To the hajji, Allah gives advice, tazawwadu, meaning take with you your luggage, take with you your clothing, your food, your medication, your dollars, whatever it might be, prepare for hajj. But the best provision you can take with you on Hajj is taqwa, is to keep Allah with you, to be conscious of Allah. Because there are things, no matter how much you take with you, you're going to get an obstacle on your Hajj, where the only answer to that is to be conscious of Allah. When you're being pushed and bumped, when someone harms you or wrongs you, when you are delayed, when you are sick, the only thing you have prepared is taqwa of Allah. Now that is not only a message we give for the Hajj. We give you every day in Jummah, ittaqullah. We give the person when he performs his nikah, ittaqullah. Be conscious of Allah. The best advice we can take on the journey of life, not just the journey of hajj, is to make Allah your central focal point. Be conscious of Allah. Ask yourself, why am I doing this? The hajj, he knows this. When he can ask himself, should I push in the queue? Should I argue? No, no, I'm here for the sake of Allah. If we translate that into our daily life, when we do our business, when we speak to our wives, when we speak to our neighbors, when we argue and debate with our opponents, we ask, am I doing it for the sake of Allah or for my sake? When you say, I do it for the sake of Allah, you would find that barakah, that beauty of this deen coming out. So may Allah bless us. May Allah accept from us. May Allah grant all our hujaj, hajj mabroor, hajj makbul. May Allah continue to put that love for these holy places in our hearts. May we all be there soon. Ameen. Jazakallah khair.